myself. So hi everyone, my name is Tracy Nguyen and I'm the training manager at the California School-Based Health Alliance. Welcome to our webinar on My Voice Saves Lives, Engaging Young People as To Be Peer Educators. And so without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump into uh, some basic housekeeping, right? First off, we want to make sure we're thanking our funders. So we gratefully acknowledge the support and uh, the support of the California Department of Education Tobacco Use Prevention Education Program for this project and the contents do not necessarily reflect the position or policy of the CDE. And this webinar is being recorded and recording and slides will be shared with you all after this webinar. Please hang tight. It will also be shared to those of us who are not able to join here to us today and also be on our website as well. Again, we just ask for your patience um, until we're able to send it out and share it with you all. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to put your questions inside the group chat or inside the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your Zoom menu bar. You should have that option. Um, and we'll do our best to get to your questions. There will be a dedicated Q&A time towards the end of this webinar where our presenters will be answering your questions. But if they're able to throughout the presentation, they'll try to answer it as well. And then... Moving on, if you don't know about us, we are the California School-Based Health Alliance. We are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in school. So really, our work is based on two basic concepts. First, healthcare should be accessible and where kids are. And second, schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. And really, we do this through three ways. First is capacity building, then we have technical assistance, and then we're also providing webinars and workshops like the ones we are doing today. So we're excited to have you here. And if you're interested in learning more about what we do and looking into our additional resources, our previous recordings and slides, feel free to do so. I believe um, the link is already in the chat. So check us out if you're interested in learning more. And kind of along with that, CSHA, we have always hosted our annual school health conference in 2025. We'll be hosting it in Anaheim at the um, Hyatt Regency Orange County on April 28th and April 29th. So if this is of interest, please save the date. Registration is forthcoming. And then there should be um, a link in the group chat as well that shares more information as we're able to finalize things and share it out with the field. But we hope that we see you all there in Anaheim and we learn about the power of partnerships together. And kind of along with that, um, if your organization is not already a member, please consider joining. Um, there are certain perks like conference registration discount, which I'd like to highlight if there are two or more colleagues of your in your organization, for example, who are interested in joining our conference, it really pays for itself if you, do, if you have a membership. So there's that. And then there's also um, tailored technical assistance to your organizational needs. So that's a little bit about membership. If you're interested in learning more, there should be a link in the group chat and you can always check it out and you can always ask for more information if you're interested. And then for today, this webinar, we'll be exploring the role of adults and young people as partners in school-based tobacco use prevention education programs. And today we have here with us Derek Kirk. He is the Youth Development Specialist with the Contra Costa County Office of Education Tobacco Use Prevention Education Program. And Derek trains hundreds of middle and high school students yearly throughout Contra Costa County to institute peer-to-peer -to -peer tobacco prevention on their campuses. And along with site level work, Derek also co-coordinates the County Youth Health Coalition or Courage. He has worked for the county for the past nine years and he's also currently serving as the co-chair for the Tobacco Prevention Coalition. And also here with us today, because we're talking about to be peer educators, right? We can't really talk about this um, unless we have a young person here with us today. So very excited to share that. We have Shio Gandhi with here to us, and I believe Ahana Kumar, um, she will also join us momentarily if she's able to, but if not, we definitely have Shio here um, and she'll be sharing her expertise, her experiences and her thoughts with us. And it's really, um, a really important thing to have, to have youth voice represented in the work that we do. And so we're excited to have both Derek and Shio here with us today. And both Ahana and Shio are part of this Courage Youth Group. And so a little bit about Courage is that they are a youth-directed group that plays a leadership role in addressing health-related issues. Members develop skills that empower them to create healthy environments through awareness and advocacy projects. And past projects have included alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs 
drug prevention, workshops at conferences, speaking at city council meetings, and then there's also countywide contests. But with that, I'd love to pass it over to Derek and Shiel uh, for the presentation. Go ahead and take it away once I stop sharing. Afternoon, wonderful people. If you're on West Coast time, I don't know if they pass this, but you know, howdy. Hopefully your October isn't moving as fast as the beginning of school year. Um, yes, my name is Derek Kirk. I'm from Contra Costa County Office of Education um, up here in East Bay. And yeah, we get to have the wonderful privilege of talking about our phenomenal young people, what they've done, what they accomplished. And I'm just, I'm a spectator for the most part. I just come around, throw candy in the air, a couple surprises and stuff like that, and we all get it going. So uh, we're going to share some information today that I hope we uh, shed light and just build upon what you're able to do with your young people in your area, because we've seen not only from our lens, uh, as well as what takes place um, on their side, they do so much. They do so much. And when we partner with them, we get an effective outcome. And that's why we intentionally target working with young people so we can see what takes place when they come into the world of doing the great work they're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. All right, and share my sound too. All right, are we good? We good? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So we should be good to go, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the um chat as well as the Q and A. If you want to throw some questions out there, get to multitask and have some fun. So um, my voice saved lives, engaging young people as two peer educators, uh, and then as I'm referring to. When me and Sheila are talking, she's coming from two sides. She's phenomenal in two ways. She started out as a two peer educator. And then she said, oh, this is wonderful. I like to have an impact in my school, in my community, and I get to tell them what to do. And then she's like, you know what? I want to do this on a larger scale. So she got grafted into our Youth Health Coalition, which is Courage, and they do um, community level work. So she's going to be sharing information from both lenses because she's phenomenal like that. I want to be like her when I grow up. So um uh, as I said, my name is Derek Kirk, and then we have Sheila with us, who's uh, just just blowing out the water. Everything she does, she touches, she does phenomenal work, and she shares um, from a place of knowing. So we're going to cover the power of youth today. We're going to talk about why they're empowered by uh, adults makes a great hand-in-hand -hand partnership. We're going to talk about the roles and expectations of adult allies. We're going to talk about the role of young people when they're working with adults, because it's two-sided. What we do, what they do is helpful. And then young people as peer educators, because that's 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 the majority of my work. I'm working with these squirrely young people that are excited and hate tobacco. So we're going to talk about what they do, what they accomplish. So um, in case you don't know, I don't know if you don't if you don't know why you're here. Tobacco use prevention education two P is what we do up and down the state. Um, the programs are expanding. Um, it does a great outreach when you have young people included. And so for our county, our model, we use young people to teach other young people, and we do it on a county level as well as a school-wide basis. So I'm going to start us off by showing a little video, a quick video that kind of highlights our program in general. The sound's not playing with me. With the growth and the popularity of electronic smoking being vape pens, e-cigarettes, hookah pens, we're seeing a new generation of young people who are being introduced to nicotine who would never pick up a cigarette. And so now what we're doing is reintroducing the dangers of tobacco and nicotine and addiction and smoking, all that like a fresh to a generation that may have heard some of the dire things about it, but not truly understand it. And with us incorporating peer-to-peer -peer education, it's a beautiful marriage of letting their influence and their passion be attached to it. So it's critical right now. It's a well-rounded program. It doesn't just touch on, you know, the fact that tobacco is bad. I think that's something that we all know. The fact that the youth are the ones giving the message, it's so much more powerful and uh, I think it makes a bigger impact with the peers. Well, I noticed that so many people die, 400,000 a year. Since so many people start at a young age, it's so much better when you try to stop them early because then they'll never try it. And I just want to help people with that because I don't like seeing so many people die from something that they it was their choice to start. 
So I love the diversity of my students. Um, it's, it's not your typical club group, and so it's, it's wonderful to see that and all those bonds being made. I think that might be one of my favorite things, is it's just the pure educators themselves and the way they come together. Like my dad said, they aren't your friends if they offer you some, so probably can't be a friend, but I can be a friend making them so. I think the best part about being a peer educator is walking down the halls and you just kind of have this established, hey, I know that girl, she told me why my grandpa shouldn't smoke. And I, that kind of gave me a sense of pride, that whole, I'm actually making someone's life better. And there's a possibility of saving one too, because we can't all be firefighters and police officers, but I can be a peer educator, so I'm going to do my best with what I've got. I love working with the youth because they, they bring a vibrancy, a passion, a love, and to see them advocate at this age is awesome. From going into the classroom to doing presentations, to standing before the Board of Supervisors, speaking about tobacco awareness in the community, it's awesome watching youth um, take hold of something that's close to their heart. As you see, I keep it real. I keep the same hat and everything, but I do recognize my jogging has been helping me because I lost weight. Let's get it. Okay. Um, so that was just a glimpse of uh, some of our young people in action and just sharing from their viewpoints. It wasn't scripted. We just pulled some young people together and say, hey, tell us about the program as well as some of the adults in there. They share from their uh, viewpoint, the ones who have been doing the program for a while. So Tupi is alive and kicking, and it does a great job of uh, touching a large amount of students in our, our districts um, throughout here because we work with 13 directly with Tier 2. So um, talking about Tupi, the goal of tobacco use prevention is to prevent or to reduce the use of nicotine addiction. We know tobacco and vaping is a dastardly thing that's out there. And as long as we live, this company does these companies don't quit. They keep coming up with new things, you know, Zen and such crazy. So we want to reduce the use of nicotine addiction in our districts and such. And then we use evidence-based information as well as research. We package this stuff together to help our young people be effective. And through the Tupi side on our, in our county, um, Tupi functions through classroom prevention programs, as well as I'm over the youth development portion with another um, youth development specialist along with me. We also, also offer intervention and cessation. Um, and then we moved into staff development where we do presentations to staff because it's not enough that students know, the staff need to know. There's a bunch of new crazy things out there that they can be aware of. And then we've also been moving more into family engagement. So we do like webinars and at um, parent back to school nights with parent education. So trying to cover all bases. And one of the biggest pieces, one of the components of Tupi is our peer educators. Let's go. They do so many wonderful things. Um, they're the young people that are on the ground, touching, speaking, highlighting. They get to have some fun. They get to be influential. And we'll talk about just a vast array of young people that can be included in because it's not just one particular demographic you're looking for. The diversity makes the program well. And so in this, we have the support and the power of the energy fueled young people who are ready to do this work. So I got one more video. It kind of highlights when we're trying to draw them in because, you know, you got to use some bait here, folks. Every young person is not like, yeah, I want to go talking in front of people. You got to find out what works for them. So we do videos, bells, whistles, prizes, whatever you think, incentives, um, whatever you needed to get them on board. So this is a video we also created to kind of get young people spurred on to want to participate in Tupi.
course, you see, we add fun to it and we offer that to our site coordinators to kind of throw the bait on there to get young people in. So the goal is to get young people participating and excited as much as possible. So I'm going to throw my first question out there to Sheil and she can add in. Sheil, I'm going to be sneaky to him. I add a little bit to this question. You know, you know how we work. Come on now. So your question is, uh, why did we, why did you choose to be a 2P peer educator? And then can you tell us a bit about what your youth adult partnerships is at your school? Because you started in middle school. And what does that program look like for you? And then if you want to, before you answer that fully, can you tell how you found out about Tupi? So how you found about Tupi along with that as well. What you got? Okay. So the entire process started like at the end of sixth grade, where I went to my counselor and I told her that I want to be a part of something that's for good. I feel like that would be good for me because I have a lot of leadership skills and I want to advocate for something, but I haven't quite found the place yet. So in seventh grade, I was one of the lucky seven people to join the first the first ever 2P club meeting that my school has ever had. I come from Winnemia Ranch Middle School. And so in seventh grade, I was selected and I'm like, okay, let's go through with this process. So I went through with this process and I realized 2P is not only just about advocating, it's about developing a family in which everyone does something for the, for good, right? So I realized, okay, I'm going to take these leadership skills and move on to the next level. I chose to stay in 2P because of the friendships I made along the way and the what I learned, what people taught me. Um, after all of the trainings, uh, I met Derek for the first time in, when I was in seventh grade at one of the 2P trainings for presentations. And I learned so much that day, I will never forget. And I stayed and I became the president of that club in eighth grade. And I led around 30 kids in Winnemere Ranch to advocate, go through the trainings and teach other and make their own families and teach other kids on how to on ad, on advocating for this cause. And a bit about the youth adult partnerships in my school. Well, obviously we have our site coordinator and she's very connected, or this is in Windermere. I just started off as a freshman, right? Right now I'm a freshman in Doherty Valley, but in Windermere, our site coordinator, Ms. Kaplenko, she was really sweet and she always connected with the students. She always asked us what to do at officer meetings. Our She would help us make our agendas and she would always, communicate with us what courage would tell us. So I got into courage in eighth grade and I communicated a lot of what courage did to my 2P kids. So I really, really liked that connection. That was like the best part. So, and obviously Derek, Derek has a lot to do with courage and he has a lot to do with 2P. He, he works super duper hard on all of, all of the stuff, talking to our site coordinators as well. So I'd like to thank Derek for that as well. Uh, folks, by the way, I did not bribe her to say any of that. That was unsolicited. So just want to put that out there. Uh, but yes, uh, Sheil and the squad, especially at her middle school, they are a powerhouse. Um, not only do they get peer educators, they get a bunch of them, but they get quality, like they're competitive. And then I actually had the honor, not only after training them to go on to one of their meetings, it was like being in a like a, a a mini assembly like they're out there planning getting each other quiet you sit over there y'all do that i was like look at this structure going forth me and the site coordinator was talking on the side talking about brownies the whole time because they were handling business so they are an excellent example of what it's like when young people take hold of what the uh authority power they have the capability they walked in it and i was just excited to be part of it and observe, observing y'all see how she was like yeah my toopy kids she's already got that teacher mentality it's gonna happen mm -hmm. so um i thank you for sharing that um Shio, because it's, it's critical that adults see the importance of it and what it does to supply our young people so in this um we always uh teach from or stand with a, um, a model from what's called hearts ladder and it's about the youth development approach you want to be mindful of how you're engaging young people to work with your programs and to do it effectively. Um, young people are part of the solution and not the problem. We know that tobacco and vaping, yes, it shows up in our younger people as they are in middle school and high school, but they're the ones who can bring about the solution because their voice speaking to others and adults who can make decisions brings about that conclusion that's better for them on a, in the long run. So the goal is to work in partnership with young people. So if you're looking at Hearts Ladder, um, Starting at the bottom is like sometimes that's where some new sites might start out as, you know, 
you know, you're trying to gain traction of getting a group on campus, but you don't want to hover with those bottom three rungs. So looking at the bottom ones, you got the youth are used as man they're manipulated, their decoration, they're just there for show. Some sites rest there. I'll be real. I've, I've seen some organizations. I'm not saying Tupi. OK, well, let's take Tupi off the board. We don't do that. But others organizations they'll just have young people there it's like hey we got a thing that we want to do for young persons look at this one in the background they are here to support like nah you just put them there and then the other side of it we've actually had people reach out to our office like hey Tupi, we got some things going down in the county could we get some of your kids to kind of come and show up and say some stuff like no they don't know the issue they haven't been talked to. You just want to pull them in and say, hey, we're doing it for them. So you don't want them to be manipulated or decoration or just they're participating so you can have a young face in the crowd. You want them to be engaged the whole way. So if you're starting your program out, yeah, you might have to draw some young people in and whatever you got to get them in the door. That's fine. Uh, whatever recruitment strategy you got, we'll take it. But you want to move them up to a place where they have not only influence, their voice is heard, they're connected. So as you're going up the rungs, looking at number four, this is where you may still be assigning them tasks. You're informing them why and you're letting them know the purpose of the project. Getting up to that fifth rung, this is where the adults make the decisions, but we're talking to the young people. We're asking them their input. They're bringing in their viewpoint on what we're asking them about because sometimes they need like a little bit of nudge on what issues are out there. When you get to six, that's very strong. That means adults might have say, hey, this is an issue taking place in the county. What do y'all think about it? So the young people might give their decision and then based upon what they say, they may target it. Seven is a phenomenal place. This is where young people say, hey, I see this in the uh, community. I see this on my campus. What can we do? And they're using adults more for resources because they already put their passion into it. And then if you get to number eight, you're just holding it down. That's where young people, they don't even need you. You're the decoration, which is a positive. So just like me and the site coordinator, I went in the mirror sitting on the site eating brownies. That was a perfect example of them taking the meeting, taking ownership and walking it out. That's where you want them to be. Their voice is very powerful. It matters. And if we can show them that early, they go on to take it higher. Like when she goes on, she goes on to be like a congresswoman. I'm voting. I'll do it for sure. So what I'm going to do is, uh, oh, I forgot to highlight. Yeah, you don't want to be in the bottom rungs. You want to sit towards the four and higher. And you want to just each time build capacity. To be all the way real, we did a presentation in May. Yes, they they asked for us to do adult youth, uh, youth adult partnerships presentation similar to this one for a, a SEL conference up in Sacramento. And I took three Courage members with us. We drove up there, battled through traffic. We did the presentation. And in the presentation, I'm of course, I'm highlighting Harsh Ladder again. We come back, we're celebrating high fives, like good presentation, good job, good workshop, guys. And then over the summer, as we're planning for this school year, one of the Courage members who was in the workshop was like, hey, could we take on this uh, responsibility during a meeting, or can we take this on? Because remember how you said on Heart's Ladder, we're like at this number, we want to move up to here. I was like, wow. So just hearing what the intention was, that youth was like, hey, can we step in more? I was like, sure, takes it off my plate and it empowers you. So this year, we actually, through the Youth Health Coalition, they not only have separate work groups, but they also have committees based upon the idea of a young person saying, hey, we can take on more because we're capable. So I'm like, sure, go right ahead. So those are just things that you want to implement. So real quick, I have a couple of uh, examples, and if you're able to, I know sometimes you're listening, multitasking, I get it. I'll keep an eye on the chat. I'm going to read off a scenario. I want you in the chat to throw out what number do you think it is in accordance with Hearts Ladder. I only did four through eight because we don't want to hover with one through three. So I'm going to read off a scenario. I want you to throw in the chat what you think it is, okay? So uh, let's go where we at. So um, at a local middle school, a Tupi site coordinator recruited 10 students as peer educators. These students attended an adult-led training. They utilized ready-to-go lessons de developed by the adult staff, sometimes editing a slide deck on their own. They led three lessons with their peers. 98% uh, of the students participated reported that they learned something new and fun about tobacco. All right. In that, can you throw in the chat, what level do you think this group is? Oh, somebody said a five. They got about a five. Okay. 4.4.5 4 or 45. Got it. Six. Okay. All right. All right. Take a couple more seconds. Fours. Okay. Got four, five, seven. Oh, they said seven. Okay. All right. Six, five, six. Okay. This one, as you can see, most of y'all got it kind of right. It's hovering between that four and five, where the adult might be starting it out 
they're handing out some responsibility, but then this youth start taking over. So the goal is, like I said, you want to incorporate them more and more. If you got to start out on your own, that's completely fine, but you want to build them higher as they go up. Okay. Um, example number two, public health staff found out the city was going to be considered uh, considering its tobacco policy, policy at their upcoming meeting and issued an action alert. As is sometimes the case, this was short notice with the meeting happening the following evening. However, the adult allies with the Youth Health Coalition were able to share the information with their student members since they had already engaged them with similar things earlier in the year. They were young people who were equipped and excited to attend the city council meeting, provided that their recommendations come for public comment. Okay, what do we think this group is? Throw it in chat. What level do we think we are? Got six, six, four, six between six and seven. Okay, okay. Six is okay. Seven, okay, okay. Six point six point five, <laughs> halfway in between. Okay. Uh, for those who threw out the six range, about right. This is where they already had the information. They they were prepared. They're not decoration, and at the same time, they made a decision that they wanted to go and participate. As I said, it's if you're just telling them what to do, it's not a good place for them to be empowered. You want them to have their own decisions. Okay. Uh, let's go with one more. A local high school was part of a two P grant with their district. When a district was not selected for another 2P grant, the district unfortunately no longer had the resources to support this uh, coordinate the program there. When the district rejoined the consortium in the following three years, the site let us know that they never stopped doing peer education programs because the students kept showing up. Because of the student leadership, the young people kept the program going for years during the district without a grant. While the staff person was supportive, the students were the ones who led their continued to be effort on campus. One of the seasoned peer educators led part of the first countywide site coordinator training, educating teachers around this. What do we think they are on this one, folks? Oh, your numbers. Hey, 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 hey uh, y'all got it. See, I was, you know, it was sneaky. I was leading this up the ladder. You got it. But yes, and this is something that actually happened in our county. One of our districts with our 2P grant there every three years, when our districts decided not to join a consortium for three years. So they had it and then they didn't have it for three years. In that three years, they weren't getting funded to do 2P. And then after three years, they came back on. So we go back to that district like, hey, you're part of 2P now. You want to get your 2P program running again. And the site coordinator at the site was like, again, we never stopped. Uh, you never stop what they just kept coming. And so I supported them. And so they had the passion to move it forward and they kept it going on their campus because they knew it was an important role. That's a wonderful example of them taking it on like, hey, this is what we need. You can supply this resource, this room. You can speak to the principal for me, but this is what we need to take place. So that's what you want to build your young people for. Awesome example. So um, the role of adult ally with students, the students, um, the adult ally role, our role is to conduct an effective in-person, whether it's virtual, classroom presentations. We talk about the health risks associated with usage, and we focus on the healthy alternatives, right? That's what we bring in. We bring information. We bring up-to-date things. Every year when we do our trainings, I give the young people fresh information as well as giving them empowerment on what they could do with it. For a peer ad advocate, peer educator, advocate, whatever you call it in your area, peer educators, they're the ones who take that message, that information, they roll it out and they deliver it to their school sites. Now, they can create new activities or they can use some of the tried and true ones. We have some sites where they have a new trend. If it's a TikTok that's out there and they'll formulate it and make it tupefied. I just made a word. Yes, tupefied. They tupefy it. And they take it and they deliver it to the school system so they can be informed. So uh, young people take it, they distribute out and they're doing classroom presentations. They're doing school out of fence. As I said, they take that information that they learn and they're the ones who disseminate it to their campuses. And this is where we have that effective hand in hand. So this brings me to my next question. Chill. Um, since you and your phenomenal Windermerians have done some impactful work and you're doing some now on a high school level, what has the impact been on yourself, um, your program? And you can view it from the Windermere side and or your intended audience. What has the impact been for those areas for you? So, of course, the overall is a positive impact. Um, I learned a lot for the last like three years of me being a part of 2P and almost soon to be two years of courage. I learned a lot. I learn more every single meeting I have. 
I still handle stuff at Windermere, even though I'm in Doherty Valley right now. I still butt in every time there's a conflict in Windermere because I always I always want to make it better for everyone. So I always want everyone to have a positive impact. I believe that starting ever since I started presentations in seventh grade, I did give the positive impact on other people when I taught them. And I taught them that this opportunity exists on advocating for drug prevention. And how I taught them what kind of drugs there are, what how to say no. We went through all of the slide decks. I believe that the whole like idea of 2P and courage and any coalition with drug prevention is always positive. Our intended audience, like for example, the TTT conference, we had people from all over, um, all over like counties everywhere. And I was hosted, I hosted, I think I opened for TTT in March this year. And there are so many, there were so many passionate faces. And I I just felt really happy that I got the opportunity to present to them. And speaking of which, yes, totally agree. She, I was there taking pictures like a proud dad in the back of the room. I'm like, oh, look at this, it's wonderful. That picture on the screen is some of our courage members who are also peer educators at the TTT conference a few years ago. So yeah, they the goal is to make them stronger. Like you want to add more to them to increase them. And I've seen it uh, across the board from middle school to high school. And many times they keep it going forward because it's so effective and what they do is so important. So want to continue to keep that in mind as we're working with our young people. So tips for adults. We need some tips to do this effectively from my years of experience and things that have taken place. Um, when you're talking to young people trying to build up your peer educator program, when you try to get them on, when you're trying to relate information, be authentic. They can smell, they can sniff it out if you are fake. They know, especially middle schoolers. They got noses for people who ain't talking real. So you got to be real. Don't be fake. Don't be coming out there trying you slang that's not yours. Like, if that's, don't say it. Just stick with you. Just be who you are, right? They'll respond better to that, even if it's corny. Um, partner with young people. As I said before, they're the solution, not the problem. They're the ones being impacted, but they're also ones who can bring change because adults coming in just saying, hey, you shouldn't do that. This is bad. Especially talking about vaping. It's a different landscape, way different into tra traditional tobacco. So what they look at, what they hear, what they know differs from what we'll try to tell them. So having a young person coming in and speak the same thing that you could say may have a more open ear. Um, engage young people and be patient and open to listen to them. Because sometimes on the campus, their issues are way different than what you project as an adult. Yeah. How many of y'all have ever walked in the bathroom and seen a kid vaping? What are you going to do then? Huh? Especially if you have to go. Yeah. So you got to see it from their lens. Uh, be patient and open to hear what their issues are and how you can ha effectively help them. Um, look for young people who are listening um, and young people listen too. So that means we don't always, when I'm teaching adults on how to grab young people, don't always go for the A student. Most of the time that A student got like 20 things they're doing anyway. That's nice. You might wanna look for that BC range kid. You know what I'm saying? They might not be doing a whole lot. They're looking for opportunity to step in and to do something that might be their lane. Another side of it is uh, in our districts, we don't push against if a kid actually had used or got caught using. Sometimes them come into training They'll hear information that they didn't know. And I've seen young people go on to Spark and be peer educators. There was a student in one of our districts who actually overdosed on an edible in school. And then a couple months later, found out he was a peer educator. It's like, oh, let's go. So uh, be open to the ones who might be more influential past than what you know. Tip, if you want to find an influential, influential kid, go to PE. On the field, those are the ones running stuff. Don't look in the classroom. Go to PE. You'll find them. Okay? Uh, find out what impacts that what impacts they want to make. So if you're partnering with them, don't tell them you should be doing this. We do surveys here at 2P. We ask our adults, we ask our young people what they're looking for, because if we're trying to uh, assume, we can miss the mark. So asking them what's important is key. Keep the conversation going. You want to have conversations throughout the year. So don't just do it once at the beginning of the year and like think it's going to hold as you move from September to December and then flipping into the new year. You got to have the conversation continuing. And then, of course, as adults, you got to set a positive example. Don't be out there telling them not to vape and not do this. And you, they catch you around the corner on the alley by school with something in your mouth. You know who you are. Be positive. And then uh, provide incentives. Benefit. We call them benefits of belonging up here. And please, adults, let's get away from the traditional. Don't just get that raggedy T-shirt or uh, 
uh, oh my goodness, if I see anybody with a visor, if I see another adult try to give a kid a visor, I'm there's going to be a campaign online. <laughs> I find stuff online, the stuff you pay for, like a bunch of t-shirts or uh, fanny packs, stuff like that. You can get things they like. They get cell phone fans out here, charging cables. They get stuff that's associated with phones. They will love you forever. They even got earbuds. Kids love the earbuds. And so have fun. You got to include fun. So if you're trying to get them to participate, you don't want to just be PowerPoint heavy. You want to give them activities they can do that has engagement, pull out some chuckles. There's a bunch of resources that you can pull in. Our training days are fun. Shield, nod your head. Is training days fun? See, I didn't tell her to do that. I just asked her. <laughs> but no, we have a lot of fun at our trainings. We pull a bunch of students in. I'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, our trainings are wonderful. So when it comes to recruitment, um, Self-selected through, it, it varies. I'll say this. We don't say there's a template that each school should go through. We give them options. So if you know students on campus, grab them. they come to your classroom to eat lunch because they don't like hanging out in the courtyard because it's hot. Pull them and say, hey, you, come here. Hey, you look like you like my classroom. you part of Tupi. It's fine. Sometimes they come along and they're like, hey, I really enjoy this. So you can do flyers. You can pull them in from lunchtime. You can make announcements. Uh, if you talk to your school staff, say, hey, um, do you know any young people who'd be good for uh, the peer educator program? I'm just starting this out. I need some young people. Pull up on other people on your site. They may know, right? They may have somebody who in mind. Uh, also, use peers to get other peers. She'll start it out. She said it was a handful of them. I watched them work. They started grabbing other kids to come in. They even do that with Courage with the Youth Health Coalition. They're like, hey, you like to be on campus? This next level. And you get some money. So we get to see them grow from there. So get peers to bring other peers. Tells you, you got to use what fish you got at your campuses. And then you can also, hey, I call this cherry picking. If you don't have any kids you're connected to, you might be a counselor on campus. You go to other groups that have kids moving. Like, hey, what's up, random kid who's already doing a bunch of stuff? You want to do something else? Come here. I got a Reese's Pieces. Like, whatever you got to use, pull them in. So if you want to go to existing groups or groups that have common things like your uh, dear, <laughs> not dear, <laughs> your red ribbon week people, your leadership groups, pull them in because sometimes they're already doing the work. They might be perfect for your peer educator programs. Keep that in mind. And as I said, our trainings is lit lit. We have some fun folks. So like I said, they get the updated information of what the new Tupi stuff is. We also demonstrate activities that they can do. So they actually have fun with it. It's not, like I said, it's not a bunch of PowerPoints. They're up, they're moving, they're interacting with kids from other schools that they've never seen before. You got to get them out the comfort zone. The activities that we give, we do, we do breakout boxes. We do, we don't do Kahoot no more because they are Kahooted out. They got other versions of Kahoot. If you want to do like a game, we got buzzers, uh, fog machines and sprinkling confetti everywhere. I'm capping. We don't use confetti, but we do have a bunch of fun. And then what they gain, what this model there, they get facilitation skills. They get planning time. This gets them geared up for the school year. So their trainings are to kick off for the year and they have a fun time with it. And so when they go back to their campuses, they do a wide array of things. So this is some of our peer educators at a high school doing a school wide tabling. So they go out to the courtyard, they open up a table, they break out the nasty lungs, they're handing out incentives, they're interacting with students who are passing by. This is where you catch a large group of students at one time. So this is one of our high schools in West County. They always have a good turnout because their two program keeps it going. And then we had a... um. Uh, one of our uh, alt ed sites, they don't have a whole huge population. So they invited me to come out to do a Q&A during one of their podcasts. So they created the questions. They sat me down. They interviewed me. It was a little nerve wracking. I was a little nervous. I was trying to make sure I did it right because they was they had some hard hitting questions. I wanted to make sure I did them correctly. But that was the way that they recorded it. Then they streamed it through the whole school during announcements. So they covered the whole school with that one. And then you also have a. Uh, Another form of that is classroom presentations where instead of being out in the courtyard, they're going to like 30, 40 kids at a time in class. This is where a teacher sets it up where they come in. These wonderful young, actually the two presenters right there, they're both encouraged. One of them is still encouraged. And um, they not only, I know some of y'all, y'all see those, the lung set up, the nasty lungs. They had those, but these two phenomenal young people, they went a step further because their school focuses on the medical on the inside, they went to the local market and bought a, a cow heart, if I'm not mistaken. And they put that under the Elmo and they're not only showing the lungs, they're showing how the lungs or how the heart's impacted. I'm like, it's disgusting, but I applaud your over and aboveness because I don't even have a script for y'all. <laughs> 
And then a, one of the other ones we advocate that they actually go on to do presentations to staff on campus. Now, us at our 2P site, we're more than happy to do that. But they go in when they present to the staff and talk about what 2P is, what they're seeing on campus. You see the light bulbs going off for other teachers like, oh, didn't know that was an issue. So when they speak and present what's on their hearts, now you get buy in from sites, uh, site level staff who will be more willing to let them come into the classroom. So keep that in mind. There's different ways they can have an output when it comes to them speaking and presenting. Right. So how do you keep them once you get them? Respect their efforts and time. Don't let your meetings when you have them. And I recommend no less than two meetings a month. If you do one, you might get them straggling in after a while. We have some sites that meet four times a month. They meet every week. Some sites meet every day because they have those students in leadership, whatever it looks like. We've surveyed our young people. The peer educators always say no matter how much they meet, they want to meet more. So keep that in mind. Respect their time and efforts. Make sure that meetings are uh, meaningful and make sure that meetings are consistent. Don't be canceling them because you wanted to go to Chipotle on your lunch break instead of meet with the young people. Keep them coming by you being regular. You set the standard. OK, and then listen to their ideas. Uh, don't just say, hey, what do y'all want to do? And then they start talking, you smacking over them like, all right, well, this is what we're going to do. You want to allow them to make their decisions if they're presenting what's on their hearts or what's important to them. You want to fuel their passion. You don't want to douse it, folks. We know some people who do that. And then, of course, as I said, you want to transfer leadership. As I said, my example earlier, when that young person from Courage is like, hey, can we do this? Can we take this on? Sure. It makes it easier for me and it makes you feel good. Gold star. It's a win-win. So you want to transfer leadership by giving them more responsibility, allowing them to take ownership of what they're able to do. I'm telling you, it pays off well. Um, how do you keep them as well? Incentives. You got to give them stuff. If you ain't got stuff in your budget, figure out something like, you know, a couple of rubber bands, make it in origami. There you go. Make a little frog and bounce it around. Give it to them. Do something, but give them something. They like incentives. Benefits of belonging go a long way. If you have money in your program, you can get little knickknacks. I can give you websites that can give you stuff pretty cheap. I'm a deal hunter. I'll hook you up. But incentives are a big way to keep our young people moving forward because they like coming. Benefits of belonging. And then also one of the other things you can do, you can share the names of the ones who are on the campus who are peer educators with the teachers on campus. You'd be surprised how many teachers didn't know that certain kids were in a 2P program. And so when they come to present, it's like, that kid's in 2P? Well, they talk a lot. Well, yeah, because they like to talk. We're using that talkability. Now look how it's used in a positive force, how it could be beneficial. They came from the dark side over to Luke. Got it? So share with that with the teachers on campus. Let them know the great work that they're doing. It encourages adults to want to help support them as well because you never know. It might change the outlook of an adult, too. And then provide adequate training. What we do, we do that initial training at the beginning of the year, but we're more than happy to come back throughout the school year. If they want us to do a booster, they need updated information. If they're preparing for like a presentation, we'll give them support. Now, from the 2 side, we understand on school campuses, most teachers and site coordinators wear like a dozen hats. They got a bunch of stuff to do. So the goal is on our side is make it easy to implement as possible. So we'll do whatever, whether we need to type up something, print things off. We just want to make sure they have enough support so they can be effective. We support the adults, so it supports the young people to have a better output. And if possible, get them off campus. Oh, my goodness, they love leaving. Just as she was talking at TTT conference, so we're in um, East Bay, but just south of us is Berkeley, and they get bussed down to Berkeley. They love it. They get to sit on a bus all day, high five with kids from other schools, travel all day, come down there all morning, eat some breakfast, pick their own workshops, eat lunch, then get to do a tour of the campus they want, and then they go back home. They're like, yeah, I got to sit on the bus. Off-campus opportunities are wonderful. So if you can work that into your game plan, go right ahead. It's always good to get them um, uh, going or keep that moving. And actually, that is another nugget. That's a carrot. Say, hey, join Tupi. You get off of campus. They're like, what? Sign this list. Tell you. Use whatever you got. Nobody's hating on it. And then the last thing, celebrate their accomplishments. Celebrate what they do. Say, great job. Give them a pat on the back. Let them know that what they did was wonderful because you want to encourage them to keep moving forward. Guess it's a goal. They're doing the work. You want them to be celebrated for it. So we celebrate them and let them know throughout the year. So if you want to give out awards, we give out certificates, little things to say, thank you, one young person, for being impactful. Cool? So last question I'm throwing to you, Shield, as I threw out a lot of information. And you have the audience of many adults right now, so they have to listen and they can't stop you. 
<laughs> what advice do you have for adults who want to partner with young people? What adults, uh, what advice do you have the adults that are on the screen right now? Yes. So the fact is that young people do not have as many privileges as adults do in terms of decision making. So sometimes we all need to admit that sometimes young people can be more creative than adults. They can have more ideas, they can have more perspectives, and they can have more viewpoints. So what's wrong with having an adult ally who is ready to help at all times? When young people need to bring these perspectives and these ideas into the spotlight, and they need someone to help initiate it. Adults who want to partner with young people are like the key to opening a door for the kid to advocate on another point, on another level. So I, I will always, always, always say yes for any adult who wants to partner with any or ally with any young student who who wants to advocate for this cause. Did you just say a key to open a door? <laughs> I thought of that while I was having my lunch today. That's bars right there. I see what you're doing, <laughs> Shield. That's bars right there. We'll take that. Okay. See, I told you I'm going to be voting for you when you get older. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, those are awesome points, and I, I, I concur. Those are things that you want to um, be able to share with young people, give them that access, give them that open space, because when they are able to do that with the support of an adult, this position is on the go higher, as well as be heard, as well as function, all of that. So, yes, I concur and agree with that. And as she said, it's the key that opens the door to the hearts of the passion that breaks through on a prominent stage. There you go. Uh, Vote Shield 2026. Yay. All right. So with that, um, I'm going to stop there. And uh, hopefully that was good enough information. We want to leave some time for Q&A. So if people have any questions for me or Shia, we're monitoring the chat. I uh, have been looking at chat. I don't think I've seen anything come through, but I'm looking at chat. Or if you have any questions, I think there's a Q&A portion. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Oh, somebody asked a question about the recording. But yes, any questions, I'll leave that open for now. For me and Shia, we'll be here. My Zoom pause. I forgot I got to bring that back. Also, if there's no questions, I can also go ahead and just share my slides while folks think of their questions. Actually, no, I <laughs> said it and I manifested the question and Nancy has a question for us. So go ahead and take it away, Derek. OK, um, Nancy, I got you. So how do you manage parent consent, transportation to and from speaking engagements and excuse from uh, attendance? Great, great job. Great question. Um, I'll, I'll talk from it from both lenses. I'll talk about the peer educator side as well as courage. So when it comes to parent consent uh, from the parent, um, from the peer educators, we don't have to, from our county office, we don't require that to be delivered to us because they're functioning on campus. So it's more than anything what the sites need. Um, so if the sites need the parents to know if they want to call it a club, each district, each school is different. So from the county office lens, we don't need that from them. But uh, we do supply, like we give templates for sites to send home to the parents to let them know, like, hey, your kid's been uh, selected. Uh, hey, they had this in mind. Somebody nominated your young person to be a parent educator or they spoke up and wanted to participate. So we give that to our sites for parents to know, but we don't need that on our end from the 2P side. Uh, when it comes to transportation for our district, so when we do the trainings, we do them district wide. So the goal is to do like if we have one district, we'll try and bring all the middle schools together at the same time and train them on one day and all the high schools together and train them on another day. And that in that in those cases, we try to find a central location in each district where the students can get to. Now, depending on your location, close to a busy freeway or how big your county is, you may have to break it up. For the most of our trainings in our county, we can do that by district. Some locations, we got to do little pockets because they're so far. But yeah, for the most part, parents drop them off. And then if if some sites we know like the the freeway is has not has it is like hectic. Uh, in those early morning hours, we will have buses charted so they can make it to that destination. And then um, when it comes to excuse from attendance, it's part of Tupi. Um, our district signed up to participate in Tupi. So 
care educators are part of it. It's excused absences. So they should be good. If they're not, tell them to talk to me. We got problems. But now for the most part, they should be participating because that's what they agreed to. Um, and then on the courage side, same thing, courage. Um, they will this one, they do get forms home from parents because we have to get like media releases and such for the county office, like SHIELD, she has a media release as well as some other information. So everywhere we want to plaster her face, we can because she signed up for it and her parents agreed to it. So that's fine. So we have those forms and then transportation, they make it here. We have our monthly meeting uh, once a month where they make it here. Uh, also, our county just happens to be, our county office is centrally located. So coming from east, west, south, they can make it here without too much friction with the freeway. So they all make it here. Parents drop them off for a couple hours and then they leave afterwards. And then now when it comes to like the TTT conference, which is in Berkeley, we're strategic with our Courage members. We put them on buses from school sites that are already going down there that we charted. So we kind of kill two birds with one stone. So they go down there riding a bus with a local school that's close to them or a school that they already attend. So that kind of works out. And then, um, yeah, they now Courage takes a little bit more finagling. You might have to send a letter to the administration saying, hey, we have a Courage member who's going to present about tobacco vaping in front of like hundreds of students. So we really don't have sites that push back and say, no, they can't get out of there. As long as they get the work done, they're usually fine. So hopefully that answered your question. I took the long way around. Um, how do you get buy-in from other school staff classrooms or where do you find the most successful in finding spaces for students to actually interact with other students on campus? Great answer. Um, and as I said, having presentations to staff is wonderful. I'll do it myself, but I say if you can get the young people, if they have time to do it, it works out even better because now they get to see what's going to possibly be done in the classroom and it gets them excited. You got the young people on your campus speaking passionately. That brings it in as well as understanding what the issues are on campus. Many sites, they don't know. They don't know what's taking place. So when your young people speak about it, that's always um, something that highlights. And then uh, most successful farm spaces. So what I also do to get out the office, I do recruitment. They call me out because some site coordinators don't have time to get students. They call us out. I'll set up a table with the nasty lungs, play some music, throw prizes in the air. By the end of it, I got like 20 or 30 kids signed up. And from there, they take the ones that are like serious and they pull them in. So setting up in a courtyard outside a lunchroom, get a set of those lungs. I'm telling you, it like flies the sugar. They will come over. Kids be eating. They, they pizza sticks while I'm trying to touch some lungs. It works every time. So find a general place to open up. Or if you want to do like a club rush, that's also a good time to kind of set up. We just did one of those in one of our high schools the other day. So trying to get through the last couple of questions. Um, and oh, they have a question for you, Shield. I will let you. Oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, I, Mark, I'll try and come back to yours. I want to get this one. Shield, the question is, uh, as a young person, is there any giveaway items you like or you think students may like besides phone accessories? I can't think of any ideas that don't seem to be super overdone. Uh, what do you think? I definitely, um, for, for, so phone accessories did go like crazy. Like we, um, in Windermere, we used to get like these boxes from like, I don't, I'm pretty sure like Courage, we used to get these boxes from like the head of like 2P, I don't know more into that, but we used to get like boxes of prizes and my site coordinator it was really funny my site coordinator always used to say that um oh the people who are peer educators get first dibs and then you could use the rest to give out prizes and presentations so when giving out these prizes i did notice that like the like uh the accessories like to write with like you writing utensils and stuff those didn't really get taken as much but the minute we had like um, I think it was like the watches, the like the little like Fitbits, those got taken away super quick. So I think anything that's like based around ele like electronics and uh, like other useful things that we also that also got taken away, the twistables, like they we had like twistable like stretchy rods, those those got taken really fast too in seventh grade, I believe. So I, I always used to like like to handle prizes and like split prizes the poppets the poppets went out super quick when they were like a trend on tiktok and they went viral so honestly for prizes my advice is just like just get prizes with like trends and um, derek said that like there's places where you can get them for really cheap for and cut you can customize them but like try and follow the trends and then you should be good 
All right, and I know I want to save some time. Thank you for answering, Shield. Um, if I'll try and get to any additional questions in the chat, but I'm gonna leave time, Tracy, because I know you had some things to share at the end. So let me stop my share. Yes, thank you so much, Derek. Okay, I have something really quick I want to share with you all, just some opportunities here. Oops. There we go. So CSHA has a couple of opportunities for you all. So the very first one is our 2P grant opportunity. So we are seeking to partner with five school sites that have a school-based health center or wellness centers and some sort of youth advisory board or just a youth group in general, right? It could be a youth group like Courage, for example, right? If they're also connected to a school-based health center, for example, to essentially participate in a peer-to-peer -peer tobacco and vaping prevention initiative. And so if this is something of interest to you and your young people, it is a mainly a youth engagement project where young people are basically educating um, their peers right about uh, tobacco use um, prevention and all that good stuff so if this is of interest to you and your young people um, please feel free to scan our QR code and fill out that survey if not the link will be put in the group chat as well so that you can click on it you can review it but there is a four thousand dollar grant attached to this if you end up being selected as one of our partners and this is for the 24-25 academic year and we hope uh, to see some more support mission so that, you know, there's an opportunity for it to engage your young people as to be peer educators even. So hopefully this is of interest to you all. And if you're interested in more about this, just reach out to us and we can provide more information as well. And then um, the other thing I wanted to share is our upcoming CSHA webinar. So this To Be Peer Educator webinar is part of CSHA's larger To Be webinar series. And so up next on November 6th from 10 to 11, we have a webinar on the Triangulum of Cannabis, Tobacco, and E-Cigarette Use. So if this is of interest to you, please feel free to uh, register. It will be in the group chat as well. And really that presentation is going to be on the how the use and co-use of cannabis and nicotine can lead to dependence and impact mental health. It will also share some best practices when working with young people as well. And we heard a little bit about it today. We'll hear a little bit more in our next webinar as well. And then in December, we have Catch My Breath Youth Vaping Prevention. So this one will focus on vaping prevention curriculum that can be used for students between 5th and 12th grade. So if you're interested in that, um, that will be taking place on December 3rd from 10 to 11. And the registration link should be in the group chat as well. But those are the opportunities I want to make sure I'm sharing with you all. If you have any questions that we cannot get to today, feel free to reach out to Derek and myself. Our email address is on the slide right there. And when you exit out of this webinar, an eval, uh, evaluation survey will pop up on your window. We ask that you please help us and please fill out that short survey so that we can continuously improve our webinar. And with that... I am, uh, this is it for our webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Derek. And thank you, Shio, for sharing your expertise, your experiences. It's been wonderful and so amazing to hear from you both. And I definitely learned a lot. I hope our attendees also got to learn a lot. But again, uh, if there's any questions, feel free to reach out to Derek and myself, and we'd be happy to answer your questions.